So, welcome, my dear friends. And in the next one hour or so, we'll be talking about assessment for competency-based medical education. I'm sure you have already attended sessions on uh, competency-based education, the basics and others. I'll just like to recapitulate the very important points which have a bearing on the way we will like to assess our students using competency-based medical education. So if we were to define CBME, it's an outcome-based education which uses competency frameworks to design, deliver, assess, and evaluate curriculum. Now what's interesting here is you would notice that it uses competency framework, that is one, and second, that the same competency framework is used to assess and evaluate the curriculum. Now that becomes important for us because it changes our approach to assessment, it changes our expectations from assessment, and it changes ultimately the way students learn by using assessment. If we were to define competency, for example, now competency is a habitual use of knowledge, attitude, skills, communications, attitudes, and values to solve a given clinical problem. But what is more important is that competency is not a all or none phenomenon. So it is not that once you put a label on somebody as competent, so for the rest of her life, he or she will be competent. The competency is incremental. That means there is always a increasing trend or incremental trend seen in competencies. And second, that while there is an incremental trend, the learners need guidance to acquire and develop these competencies. Now, this is the important point that I want to highlight, that your assessment has to guide the students to acquire and to develop competencies. Now, when we look at the incrementalness or the progression, now there can be various means to, in fact, help the learners. But if we look at the literature which is available on this, what comes out is that feedback remains one of the most important inputs, one of the best inputs to improve learning. But to serve its intended purpose, this feedback must be immediate and authentic. Immediate, it's clear that soon after a student has performed an action, you should be providing feedback to him. And authentic, that it should be real. You know, it should not look at his performance last week or last month or in a previous class or in a previous session. Rather, it should be based on ongoing assessment so that what we tell the student can be related by him and he can use that feedback to improve his performance. Let me take you to the paradigm of student assessment in competency-based education. Now this graph is self-explanatory, but what you would look here, and I want you to specifically focus on that, is that in competency-based assessment, in fact, formative assessment forms a larger part of the whole assessment as compared to only summative. Now, although there are no hard and fast rules, but in general, three-fourths of the assessment should be formative and only one-fourth should be summative. This is because formative assessment by virtue of providing feedback and not only feedback, but also things like feed up and feed forward, primes the student into a learning orientation to acquire the competencies, to improve the competencies. He is assisted by self-assessment, workplace-based assessment. He writes reflections on what he has learned. And all these actually help the student to develop competencies. And then comes the role of summative assessment, which is more like a quality control tool, which looks at what all the student has learned at the end of a unit of instruction. Now, it could be a lecture, it could be a system, it could be a semester, it could be a year, whatever. What I like request you to do is to keep this orientation in mind that 
in competency based medical education formative assessment has to play a much bigger significant and important role if we were to look at purpose of assessment and i'm sure you have already learned about these in your basic uh, medical education workshops the purpose of assessment can be divided into two prove and improve prove which is at the end of the course and which is an assessment for pass or fail or should the student go into next class or stay in the same class or should the student be selected for uh, for example postgraduate uh, seat and so on and but the second important purpose of assessment is to improve and this improve is attained by an ongoing assessment which helps to provide feedback to the learner and thereby improves the quality of learning i'll also like to bring in at this point of time the concept of utility of assessment i'm sure most of you are aware of this already but just in case you have not heard or read about it the utility of assessment is a notional concept it's not a not really a mathematical formula it's a notional concept and this utility is conceptualized by a multiplication of validity reliability feasibility acceptability and educational impact now this concept is very interesting now, if for example one particular assessment has a zero effect or even negative effect for example educational impact the i part and it actually encourages the students to learn in a way which is not the right way to learn for example they may be just reading only about mcq questions they may not be learning about skills so in that case the utility of whole assessment can actually become zero it also tells you that it is possible to work within parameters and a high rating on one parameter can be compensated by a low rating in another let me give you an example long case presentation for example for many of us would be low in reliability but being high on validity it would be as useful as an oski which may be high on reliability but which may be slightly low on validity so this way you can actually work with assessment tools making a meaningful combination of the various tools and finally deciding on a combination of tools which will give a good utility to the whole assessment process if we were to compare how does conventional assessment and competency based assessment differ the first and the most important that conventional assessment is fragmented so we look at knowledge separately skills separately attitude separately we don't look at communication or even if we look at the communication we look at communication with patient having a problem b whereas knowledge and skills we are testing with patient having problem a then conventional assessment is mostly summative and is norm referenced when i say norm referenced what it means is ki generally there is a comparison between the students contrasted to that in competency based assessment we try to assess the whole thing in a integrated way remember the definition of competency that i told you just now it's a habitual and consistent use of knowledge attitude skills communication etc to solve a given problem so what it means is that if we go on competency based medical education and again if you remember the definition that i told you just now that it's a process which uses competency framework to assess and evaluate now what it means is that you cannot have isolated fragmented assessment of knowledge skills and attitudes and then hope that you will get information about a competency secondly majority of the assessment in competency based education is formative because it's no point telling a student at the end of one year that you have not learned a competency what is more important is that throughout the year you need to assess him for the given competency 
and if he has not acquired it the way you would like it to be then you provide feedback you provide additional inputs so that the student can actually acquire the given competency and thirdly it's criterion referenced that means you don't compare the performance of one student with another student rather you compare the performance of the student with the criteria that you have already set we already have a list of competencies given for the entire mbps curricula now when you compare the performance of the student you have to compare it with those standards rather than comparing the performance of one student with the other so what are the key features of competency based assessment first that it helps the learners to acquire and develop competencies now please remember that this is one of the most important function of assessment in competency based medical education secondly direct observation plays a major role now in our conventional assessment there is very little use of direct observation now when we ask the student to prepare a case and present it to us we only look at the presentation part we don't look at how the student has actually elicited history we don't look at how the student has actually examined the patient we don't look at how did he communicate with the patient so direct observation is not really used to the extent to which it should have been and this is especially true for skill based competencies almost all skill based competencies have to be directly observed and third and the most important that all competencies have to be assessed unlike conventional education system you cannot make a sample you cannot have only two competencies out of 10 and say that the student has acquired all the competencies every competency has to be assessed now that's a tricky proposition because what it means is that the assessment has to be very broad based but the good thing is that all that does not have to be done at one go so you can do some competency assessment at for example one internal assessment some can be done at second internal assessment some can be left for the final university examination now that is another thing which i will like you to keep in mind that internal assessments in competency based education and we will talk more about it a little later are not about just replicating the assessment that is done at the university examination or university examinations are not a means of replicating the internal assessments simply because we have to follow a certain given pattern of assessment it's a useful time i feel to talk about formative and summative assessment as well because there are many misconceptions surrounding these two types of assessment when we say summative assessment what we are meaning is that it's an assessment conducted to check how much the student has learned we all use it day in and day out we are using summative assessment formative assessment on the other hand is an assessment which is conducted with the primary purpose of providing feedback for improved learning many of us associate internal assessment with formative assessment but as you will notice here they are not synonymous in fact if your internal assessment is only looks at how much the student has learned then it becomes on the other hand if you are using that opportunity to provide feedback to the student to improve his or her learning then it becomes formative so trying to make is the difference between formative and summative is in its purpose it's not the time it's not that what happens at the end of professional is a summative and what happens during rest of the year is formative it is the purpose if you are using your assessment to provide feedback to improve the learning if you are using feedback to help the student acquire competencies if you are using feedback to help the students improve on his competencies then it becomes formative otherwise it does not and it's a very useful dictum to remember that by default all assessments are summative you have to make an extra effort to make it a formative assessment and we are going to discuss about this aspect a little while from now many of you must be aware of this triangle or pyramid whatever you call it the miller pyramid of clinical competence 
you can see four layers the lowermost being nose the next knows how followed by shows how and the topmost is the does so there are a few important things i'd like to point out in this pyramid one that knowledge forms the base of clinical competence so what it means is that knowledge assessment has to be a part and parcel of every assessment that you do whether it is a skill or it is communication or it is ethics or it is professionalism or anything else you cannot go with the idea that if a student can show you something he also knows come to think of it your lab technicians for example may be able to perform an experiment better than most of the students but what they lack is the knowledge base they may not be able to explain what is happening over there so do not neglect assessment of knowledge that is one and secondly that if you want to build professional authenticity in your assessments then you have to climb up the pyramid try going as high as possible because and i'm sure you would reflect on this that most of the assessments that we have including the so called clinicals and practicals are actually centered only at knows and knows how level very few actually goes to shows how and it's extremely rare to find as of now any assessment in indian medical schools which actually assesses the students at the level of does so what it means is that by not climbing high up in the pyramid you are actually missing out on professional authenticity and it's very important to maintain authentic assessments i discussed it in the beginning if you want to help the students to acquire and develop competencies now here is the concept of assessment toolbox i'm sure you must have seen a plumber or an electrician coming to your house to do some repair work it doesn't come with only one tool it comes with a box which has got multiple things it has got a hammer it has got a screwdriver it may have a plier it may have a saw it may have screws and so whatever else is required to perform that particular task and then depending on what he has to do he picks up the required tool and completes the work now that exactly is the concept of assessment toolbox so we should have with us a number of tools as many tools as possible and then depending on what kind of competency you want to assess just as an example if you want to look at communication for example you may have to go for oscis or you may have to go for mini cx we will talk about these a little later or you may have to go for even observation of procedural skills on the other hand if you want to look at the knowledge of the student then you may be happy with say mcqs or essay type questions or case based discussion now this assessment toolbox is a very important concept and many a times we are not able to do full justice to our assessment is because we get married to only one tool some of us will say oski is an extremely useful tool and everything that we do revolves only around oski and then we miss out on whole lot of other things which are equally important and which can provide us equally important information as regards the learning status of the student is concerned now when we talk of competency based assessment there can be informal opportunities and there can be formal opportunities formal opportunities can be in the form of internal assessment they can be in the form of university examinations whatever assessment you are conducting whether it is in your classroom or it is at the university examinations a very important requirement is to have a blueprinting how much of knowledge how much of skills how much of attitudes how much of communication and this proportion would vary in certain subjects for example 
knowledge may be more important while in certain competencies skills may become more important so a proper blueprint is required to do full justice to assessment let me talk of some informal opportunities in your everyday teaching you get lot of informal opportunities to assess the students and the best part is that these informal opportunities actually provide the much needed feedback to the learner helping them to improve take for example if in the middle of your lecture you were to project a mcq and ask the students to pick up the right answer and if they are not able to then you can immediately correct it if during a clinical examination you are standing there and watching the student and you find that he has not performed certain step properly you can provide feedback now this power of informal opportunities is often neglected we do not pay full attention to informal opportunities we do not make good use of these informal opportunities another important aspect about informal opportunities is that they help you to dissociate assessment and decision making moments See, it's but natural. Even if I was to appear for an examination, for example, I would try to convey to the examiner that I know everything, and I would try to hide my weaknesses. Now that defeats the whole purpose of formative assessment. If a student is to hide his learning difficulties, if a student is to hide what he has not been able to learn, then it will not provide you an opportunity to provide him feedback. And by using these informal opportunities. where even if he gives a wrong answer for example it doesn't go against him it is only used to improve his performance and in a way these actually help to take away the stress of assessment and that's a big point not only they help to give you feedback they also help you to take away the stress and therefore it's very important to use these informal opportunities in your day to day assessment now informal opportunities can be many in fact these are just few representative examples you can think of whole lot of new ideas about how to use informal opportunities to provide feed to the students you can use them at the end of your lecture you can use them at the end of the system you can use it at the end of the chapter they can be mcqs they can be short answer questions they can be completion type of questions but whatever modality you use please make sure that you use them only to assess learning for providing feedback to the student and not and i emphasize not for computing the internal assessment scores because the moment you start using every assessment to compute their scores then it becomes a stressor then students try to hide their weaknesses and the whole purpose of formative assessment is defeated formal opportunities can be in the form of internal assessment and university examination now as discussed earlier university examinations are concerned with how much the student has learned on the other hand internal assessment is not only concerned with how much learned but also how learned so what are the study habits of the student how much is the regularity of the student how does he participate in the learning process how does he acquire new information about learning are some things which cannot be done at the university examination they can be done only during internal assessment so the fallout of this is that internal assessment and university examinations actually test different aspects so do not try to replicate one with the other in other words don't try to have internal assessments just like university examinations and conversely don't have university examinations just like internal assessment because they are both testing different aspects and one is not a replacement for other let me reproduce some extracts from the graduate medical education regulations 2019 i'm sure most of you have read if you have not then i strongly suggest that at the end of this talk please download these from the nci website i'll providing you with the link and go through them these are very important 
because all our assessment has to be in line with what is given in the GMAR. So what GMAR says about internal assessment is that periodic examination should be conducted throughout the course. There shall be no less than three. And this is what I want you to remember. Not less than three internal examinations in pre and pre paraclinical subjects and not less than two examinations in each clinical subject. And the end of posting clinical assessment shall also be held for each clinical posting in each professional year. So in effect, what it means is that even in the clinical areas, they are going to have three. So pre and para would have three. Clinical would have two and an end of the posting, in effect, making it three in each professional year. Now here, something different has been added from what was going on till now. And what it says is that in subjects that are taught at more than one phase, the proportionate weightage must be given for internal assessment for each phase. So for example, general medicine must be assessed in second professional, third professional part one, third professional part two, independently. Now what it means is that contrary to the present practice, where students generally didn't appear for, for example, medicine or surgery send up because they have to give their pharmacology and pathology send ups and then they could compensate for it by appearing later on. Now this will not happen. The marks for internal assessment in medicine or surgery or ob or community medicine, which are taught across phases, have to be divided proportionately in different professional years. And in each professional year, the student has to appear and pass in that particular examination. Now, day-to-day -day records and log books, they have to be given importance in internal assessment. I'll come back to this point a little later. Internal assessment should be based on competencies and skills. Now, that is one thing which again differentiates the current recommendation from what generally we have been doing. So it is no longer giving a theory test. It's no longer giving them a paper once every week or once every month. It is assessing them for competencies and for skills. And as I said earlier, do not ignore assessment of knowledge. So that theory part would still have to continue. Only thing is that it has to be supplemented by assessment of skills, attitudes, professionalism, ethics, communication, and so on. Now the final internal assessment in a broad clinical specialty, for example, surgery and allied specialties or medicine and allied specialties, should comprise of marks from all constituent specialties. And the proportion of marks for each constituent specialty should be determined by the time of instruction allotted to each. Now what it means is that students cannot neglect, for example, radiology or anesthesiology because these marks are going to be part of internal assessment of surgery. Same way, psychiatry, dermatology, pulmonology cannot be neglected because all the marks have to be proportionately divided depending on the time which has been allotted for teaching to each of the specialities. Internal assessment has been made mandatory before a student can appear for the final university examinations. Now this we had till now also that they had to score a certain proportion of marks. Log books would get 20% of marks both for theory and practical. And what is important is that they would need at least 40% marks separately in theory and practical, but they would need 50% marks in theory and practical combined before appearing for the final examinations. With the current system of allowing them to appear for 35% and they could make up the remaining 50% on the basis of university examinations will not happen. So they need to have 50% in aggregate and at least 40% separately in both theory and practical. Now, it has also been proposed that 
contrary to 20% marks that we were given till now in each subject for internal assessment. Now internal assessment will be conducted out of 100 marks for theory and 100 marks for practical in every subject. Except of course medicine, surgery and ob because they run through three professional years. So there it will be out of 200 marks. Now I hope you have noticed that by increasing the marks, we are allowing for more discrimination. Now, when we had only 20 marks, for example, in pediatrics, then it was very difficult to really have a question paper set up for 20 marks because then you couldn't distinguish between a student who knows and a student who doesn't know well. But now with 100 marks, it should become possible to have a larger sample of competencies included in your assessment program. Another important thing which I want you to remember is that passing in internal assessment will be shown separately in the final results. What it means is that internal assessment marks will not be added to the university marks. There was a lot of criticism about existing internal assessment that many colleges, they inflate the internal assessment marks and therefore they help the student to compensate by scoring less marks in university examination and still pass. But that doesn't happen now. So they have to pass separately in university and separately in internal assessment. And internal assessment marks are not going to be added to the final university examinations. Now, in fact, if you look at this, then it provides much more power to internal assessment. Because now it does not matter whether you get 60 or you get 70. What matters is that you have acquired all the competencies which are required for that particular phase of training. I will not uh, repeat what is the written from the GMER. Uh, you can actually download and look, but like to draw your attention to the concept of assessment toolbox that I mentioned a little while ago. So even for internals, for example, OSCE, OSPI, directly observed procedural skills, mini clinical evaluation, maintenance of records, attitudinal assessment, these all have to be given due weightage when you are planning for internal assessment. Now, here are some of the tables which you would find in a reference which I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation. Now, as told earlier, you would find that anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, for example, will have three assessments throughout the year. And one of these would be a pre-university or preliminary examination, whatever it is called in your system. What is also interesting to note is that there should be at least one short question from ATCOM in each subject area. Now, why this is important is that ATCOM is not to be seen as something which is not important because it is going to be there in every subject. So that means in first professional, for example, there are going to be short answer questions from ATCOM four times. That means at least 20 marks. So this is an indirect way of giving importance to ATCOM so that the students actually learn the competencies which are given over there. And then you'll find that even the, in the second year, while the majority of the tests are limited to the subjects which are going to have you, but you also have a number of other subjects which are going to, to be the rotations where the students are going to go for clinical postings. And even those subjects should have assessments, including one end of posting assessment at the end of each clinical posting, including, and I'm emphasizing, including those of allied subjects. So that means even for dermatology, respiratory medicine, dentistry, anesthesiology, radio diagnosis, they all should be having an assessment which is going to count towards internal assessment. I'll not go through these details. Basically, they emphasize the same point which I have already made. Now, record keeping. Record keeping is a very important part, especially when it comes to competencies. I'm sure you have already seen the logbook format which has been suggested by the MCI expert group. 
I'm sure your institutions also must have made some effort by now to come out with logbooks related to the basic sciences. Some institutions can also, or I believe many are going for e-portfolios. So rather than having a physical copy of the logbook, they have an electronic version where the student can document and the thing is uploaded to the student's record from where you can actually download it and view it anytime where it is required. Now, logbooks are not just for the sake of completion. You know, they have to be regularly completed, not only completed, but they have to be regularly assessed. And based on that assessment, you have to provide feedback. For example, and I'm just giving you one example from pediatrics because that is easy for me. For example, you may find that during case presentations, one student has presented all cases of diarrhea. Now, that defeats the purpose. You don't want him to become a dairy expert. You want him to learn about pediatrics in general. So you can provide him feedback that please make sure that you also present a case of respiratory system and malnutrition and anemia and so on. And as told earlier, that logbooks are to be considered for marks. So 20% of marks for both theory as well as practical have been allocated to the logbooks in the marks for internal assessment. It's also important that the results of internal assessment are displayed on the notice board within one to two weeks of the test. Now, once you keep on assessing the sheets over two months, three months, four months, now by the time the student gets his marks, they have forgotten what they had performed, how they had performed, and then even a feedback becomes meaningless. I told you about immediate nature of feedback, which is important. And that's why it's important that the mark should be displayed as soon as possible. Now, there may be instances where students may not be able to pass internal assessment, for example. Now, what is to be done with them? So that has been left to the universities who should frame policies and who should guide the colleges regarding what remedial measures can be taken for the students who have not been able to score the qualifying mark. Similarly, there may be students who for some reason may have missed on some of the assessment. Now, how to deal with these students? Again, the universities need to work out and tell the colleges regarding the policies that they should be following for such students. It's important, again, and this is a change from the conventional practice, that learners should have completed the required certifiable competencies for that phase of training and completed the logbook appropriate for that phase of training to be eligible for appearing at the final university examination. So that means for appearing in the second professional examination, they also must have completed all the requirements for medicine in that year. So what it means is that students cannot ignore medicine and surgery and ob because right now we are appearing for path pathology, pharmacology, etc., and we will these read clinical subjects only when we reach the final year. No, that's not going to happen. So they have to complete all the competencies for that phase and complete the logbooks for that phase before they can appear for the final university examinations. Now coming to the university examinations, as I told you, the role of university examination is different from internal assessment. And basically, they are designed to find out if the student has acquired the necessary knowledge, skills, ethical professional values, and fundamental concepts which are necessary for functioning as a physician. Now, as you would have noticed, this is different from internal assessment. So internal assessment has to be planned in a totally different way and not just be a replica of university examination. University examinations, on the other hand, would also be demanding some changes. For example, again, the concept of toolbox, that there should be different types of questions like structured essays, short answer questions, objective type questions, and so on. If you are using MCQs, then they should not be more than 20% of the total theory marks. Now, there are various reasons for this. I'll not go into those details, but if, your medicine paper, for example, is of 200 marks, then you cannot have more than 40 marks devoted to MCQs. 
Similarly, in subjects that have two papers, medicine, surgery, ob for example, now there the student requires 40% in each paper and 50% in aggregate. Now these are some of the changes which you will need to keep in mind when you are designing your university examinations for your own university or maybe as an external examiner for some other university. The practical clinical examinations in the university examination setup they will need to assess the proficiency in skills, data gathering, interpretation, and logical conclusions. It has been actually specifically mentioned now that rather than going in for complicated or only CNS cases, you should try to include cases which match what a particular student is likely to see in actual practice. So no rare syndromes, no rare cases, and focus not as much on making a diagnosis of course that is important but not only on diagnosis but also on data gathering that is history taking physical examination writing records management plans some things which to some extent were lacking in our present system of internal assessment now viva voci should assess approach to the patient management approach to emergencies ethical and professional values they can also look at skills and in interpretation of the common investigative data for example you can show x-rays over there you can keep some assessments for the students to uh, identify and uh, ask questions related to them you can put an ecg strip or an abg uh, report for example for the students to look and comment the change here is that as of now the viva marks were added to theory now the viva marks will have to be added to the practicals i'm sure you are already aware of this examination schedule so what is going to happen is that first professional mbbs examination is now scheduled for september contrasted to june or july which was the current practice similarly second professional mbbs examination would also be now in the month of september Final MBBS part one would be in the month of October. And final MBBS part two would be in the month of January. So these are just minor changes, which uh, I'm sure your universities will adjust in their calendars and uh, frame the examinations accordingly. Now, I've already talked to you about this. This is the marks allotted. So you can see that anatomy physiology biochemistry pharmacology pathology and microbiology in fact all the pre and paraclinical sciences have two papers which means the theory examination will be out of 200 practicals will be out of 100 forensic medicine ophthalmology ent and pediatrics have one paper so they will have out of 100 whereas community medicine Medicine, surgery, and ob will have two papers, which will have theory examination out of 200. Similarly, as told earlier, the practical examination for medicine, surgery, and ob will be out of 200, whereas for rest of the subjects, it will be out of 100 marks each. I already told you the passing criteria that they need 50% in theory and practical to be eligible to appear for university examination. And in the university examinations, they need 50% marks just like now in theory and practical, whereas practical is clinical plus viva. And wherever there are two papers, they need to score at least 40% in each paper and 50% in aggregate. Now, one of the important things which we want to emphasize here is that we have to start assessing the higher levels of learning. Remember the Miller's pyramid? So from only nose, you have to actually move up to nose how to shows how to does. And if you remember, I told you that professional authenticity is built the moment you start climbing higher in the pyramid. There's a very simple formula for assessing higher levels of learning, and that is to move up the pyramid. For theory, for example, the best way is to start asking questions which cannot be answered from memory alone. 
I'll give you some examples. And therefore, you should be using the higher levels of action verbs. Remember the Bloom's taxonomy? Remember the five levels of learning given in Bloom's taxonomy? And so try using higher level action verbs so that you can assess the student at a higher level of learning. Just an example. Now, rather than saying, or rather than only saying, define ABC or describe the clinical pictures of disease XYZ, why not come on to, for example, discuss the differences in clinical presentation of A and B in children and adults? Now, these are some things which cannot be answered merely from memory. The student has to apply the knowledge. Student has to mentally manipulate the knowledge and then come out with the answer. So try using the verbs going on to the higher levels of learning. So most of your questions, which till now were actually discussed, described, enumerate, etc., should now have analyze, differentiate, distinguish, determine, design appraise and so on now by using these kind of action verbs you will be assessing the students at a much higher level of learning just look at this example conventionally you can ask a simple question describe clinical features and management of hemolytic jaundice in any way so for this the student need not go to the board actually sitting in his hostel room right answer to this question very nicely because all that he needs to do is to memorize the answer from a book but if you were to frame a question like this giving a little brief history and then asking what is the provisional diagnosis and what other conditions need to be considered and which lab test you will do then the things become different now it is no longer simply copying from memory here he has to first make a diagnosis of hemolytic jaundice on the basis of history and examination findings given and then he has to answer questions related to these so long answer questions can actually be easily modified to make them testing or assessing the higher levels of learning for short answer questions many of us have this habit of either using a very small phrase like write short notes on or discuss briefly or sometimes in some universities I have seen they don't even write this they simply write cataract vitamin A deficiency now leaving it to the student what he wants to write in fact if you think from students point of view he has got a very wide canvas he can write anything and yet be correct but that anything may be far away from what you wanted him to learn if you frame your questions like this, what is the role of antibiotics in childhood diarrhea? Now he has to apply the knowledge. He has to discuss. Or if you ask, what is the unity of routine vitamin K administration during newborn period? Then he has to discuss that it prevents or it does not prevent or which situations it should be given, when it should not be given, how many doses are required. If you notice it like this, the answer might be similar in both the situations. But the way you are asking differs. And that is what makes all the difference. Because the mental process, which is triggered by asking a question like this, is very different from the mental process, which is triggered by simply asking him to write a short note on vitamin K in neonatal period. Reasoning questions. Rather than asking right immunization schedule, you ask him to plan immunization for a two years child, totally unimmunized child. Now this requires a lot knowledge of many factors. The prevalence of disease at that particular age, the physiological responses, the reaction of the vaccines, the utility of vaccine, and so many other things. So by rephrasing your questions, by making them reasoning questions, you can actually stimulate the student to read beyond the obvious like what we say reading between the lines can come only when your questions stimulate the students to read beyond the lines 
when they read only what is written in the textbook then probably we are doing only a half hearted attempt now one more important thing which i like to discuss before we conclude this talk is to align assessments because if your assessments are not aligned and that's a problem that we have been facing for last 70 years of medical education in our country assessments are not aligned and if they are not aligned then assessments override every other component i am reminded of a very popular saying that when teachers have to decide what they should teach they look at the curriculum but when students decide what they should read they look at the question papers so if your question papers do not stress all that we have been stressing in our competency based documents then probably we will fail in our efforts because the guiding force for the students would still be assessments we may talk about communication but when they find that no where we assessed communication then there will be no motivation for them to learn communication when we ask them to learn about the role of say basic sciences in clinical medicine but we find that our questions are independently assessing basic sciences and clinical sciences then for them that motivation to integrate the two actually gets diluted and if we do not align them properly please also remember that validity of assessments suffers so when we say alignment what it means is that your objectives your learning activities and your assessments they match up and so students learn what you intended them to learn and you accurately assess what the students are learning so that means you assess what you taught and you teach what you assess now that alignment becomes extremely important and if that is not there then many of the problems that we are facing in our current educational scenario can actually be traced back to the lack of alignment in the three components of education you must have already seen this golden triangle the each angle of which is formed by the three components of educational process that is learning objectives teaching learning methods and assessment imagine this triangle in the form of a wooden stool it will be stable only if all the three legs are equal in height if one leg was small for example then it would be shaky same happens with education if all the legs or limbs are not given equal importance in the planning process then the results can be disastrous another way of looking at alignment and feedback now while the basic purpose of alignment is to have objectives and teaching learning methods and teaching learning methods and assessment to be in sync but it also means that based on the results of assessment in fact you should be if required modifying your objectives and based on the results of assessment you should be modifying your teaching learning methods and if you find that certain teaching learning methods are not suitable for certain objectives then you may be modifying one of the two so this concept of feedback loop in the education system is extremely important there are many advantages of alignment the students know what to learn and how to demonstrate their learning second that it helps you to develop assessment criteria based on the learning objectives so assessment criteria no longer are linked to my whims and fancies they are linked to the learning objectives remember the term that i used earlier criterion referenced so they are not norm referenced you don't say who oh, this student has done better than him so pass him or that student was less than that so fail him that's no longer the scenario the scenario is that this student attained the objectives he passes the student couldn't attain the objectives he tries again so there can be many challenges to that if you have 
multiple objectives like for example we have broken our competencies into objectives now a direct relation between assessment of objectives and ultimate competencies might be missing this happens now also for example you may be teaching some biochemical cycle to the student but he doesn't know why he's learning that what use it is of him to know about this cycle so that he can deal with the patient presenting with a particular problem so one has to make a deliberate effort to convey maybe by telling maybe built it into the assessment system that if you are assessing something on the basic sciences related to something in the clinical areas so that the students know that what they have learned in basic sciences is going to be useful it will also promote the concept of integration at the same time i need to caution you that do not simply base all your testing on the objectives because if you do that then it can quickly degenerate into what is called teaching to the test so i frame a question and then i teach my students so that's a wrong way of doing it i should be teaching my students and then framing a question now if it degenerates into teaching the test it can actually limit learning clinical competence as we have already seen is at multiple levels from nose to nose how to shows how to does and for each level there are different assessment tools i hope the concept of assessment toolbox is more clear to you now that for each level you have to use a different tool so if you want to assess a student at the level of does you cannot use oski or you cannot simply keep on using long face or if you want the student to assess at the level of knows how you cannot be simply keep on using the conventional mcqs or the conventional essay type of questions so there is a need for a change so this assessment toolbox coupled with the levels of clinical competence actually tells you as to how effectively you can align your assessment with not only objectives but also with competencies now you would see this in the competency document and uh, this is just an example for example this competency number which says identify the etiology of meningitis based on the given csf parameters now this competency has been broken down into four objectives which are listed here for the phase 2 students now for each objective for example the student must be able to enumerate the most common causes of meningitis correctly what would be a matching or aligning assessment it would be enumerate five causes of meningitis based on their prevalence in india and same can be done for other objectives but as i cautioned you little while ago please do not base all your questions only on objectives base some questions on your competencies otherwise what will happen it will become totally test oriented teaching so if the student was to see this list of objectives for example he would just memorize these five causes of uh, meningitis he would just look at the components of cns csf analysis he would look at the csf features in a given etiology and that's it he would never be able to probably integrate the concepts of clinical picture history csf examination biochemical changes and so on into his day to day practice there's another example is to integrate now for example one competency which has been broken into multiple objectives now it would have been too easy to test each of these objectives individually for example this can be tested in microbiology clinical course for example can be tested in medicine or pediatrics or community medicine for example prevention can be tested in community medicine treatment again can be tested in pharmacology it can be tested in medicine pediatric surgery or whatever 
the infection we have been discussing. So try to include a objective and a competency both horizontally as well as vertically. Because unless you align your assessment also, unless you integrate your assessment also, the students will never give enough attention to integration. If your assessment is still strictly subject based, the students will also learn subject based. If your assessment is integrated, students will learn in a better integrated way. Now, before I conclude, just want to share these two very important resources with you. The first is an assessment module developed by the MCI expert group. And uh, most of what I have talked today is given in that module. You can actually download it, discuss it in your department, discuss in your curriculum committees, discuss in your medical education units, and make every teacher in your institution aware of these. Second is the Graduate Medical Education Regulations 2019. Again, the source is given here. Please download, go through them. This is what I can call the Bible of Medical Education for our country, because each and every action that we take, whether it is designing a timetable, whether it is writing objectives, whether it is uh, deciding on teaching learning methods, or whether it is designing the assessments, everything has to be in line with the regulations which are given here. So I'm sure you will take time and go through both of these resources. So thank you very much for listening to me in this presentation.